Hello everyone, welcome to the Geo Ecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos related to geography, research methodology and several other topics on my channel The Geo Ecologist. In this session on economic geography, we are going to learn about the resources, its concept and its world distribution. But before we go ahead, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and do share the videos with others as well. So now let's learn about the world resources and their distribution in this session. So everything that is available in our environment which satisfies our needs that is basically called resources. So the simplest definition of a resource is something which is for utility to us human beings and which helps us to gain, achieve our goals, satisfy our needs that is resource for us, right? So to become resources what is about the substances or materials? It should be technologically accessible, then it should be economically feasible, then culturally acceptable and resources are valuable or worthy for human beings. It means it has a value. So these are the basic things or attributes which makes a normal stuff or a, any object or for that matter any particular matter that is resource for us. Right. So values basically when we talk about what is the value here? Value can be economic values as well as the aesthetic values. So remember resource could be not just economical but also aesthetics, right? Which is beautiful, which is good for environment, which is good for us, which gives us pleasure. That could also be a resource, right? So time, knowledge and technology are the three things or we can say three components that change a substance to resource. So the idea is if you want to change a substance to your utility, if you want to make it as a resource, what you need to do? You need to apply these three things, trio that is time, knowledge and technology to convert that neutral stuff to resource for yourself, right? So this idea here can be represented through this flow diagram that substances under the impact of technology, knowledge, time, it can be converted to resources. So this is the basic concept of resources. Now let's elaborate further more. So what we observe here is there is a scholar called Zimmerman, Eric Walter Zimmerman, who was basically a resource economist at University of North Carolina and later at University of Texas in the United States, right? And a very important theory related to resources was his baby, his child, right? So this is called the functional theory of mineral resources. Now remember this word functional theory. It means the function is something which is making anything that is resource for us, right? So everything which has a function becomes a resource. Unless it is functional for us, it's not resource, right? So Zimmerman rejected the assumption of fixity that resources are not known or fixed things that we say or assets which are fixed. Rather, resources are those which humans employ to get their service at a given time. Right. So what happens in simple ways, you can say that this 1933 Zimmerman concept of resources or functional theory of mineral resources, which is based on basic premise that only human appraisal, right? When we ascribe value to a particular thing, then it only turns into the resource. Otherwise, it is just a neutral stuff for us, right? So what are resources today may not be tomorrow and vice versa. So resources can be what is today cannot be resource tomorrow depends upon its utility. If its utility is gone, it's no more a resource for us, right? So the last statement that you should remember with resources that resources are not, they become. It means resources are nothing. Rather, it's the creation of resources by human beings through the utility of knowledge, time, technology. So a general subject or a general matter can be converted into a resource that is important to remember. So this is the functional theory of Zimmerman and that's also known as the Zimmerman concept of resource or simply you can remember the word Zimmerman and his resource theory. Then further if you observe this is the flow diagram to be understood here. Natural resources can be divided into non-renewable and renewable resources and I'm sure you have heard of this word renewable and non-renewable right from your NCRTs in school days. So resources that are consumed when used that is basically non-renewable. They are stock resources. They do not evolve over time. They get consumed. But renewable resources are which you can renew for the services. 
right? So for example, metals can be recycled and renewed, wind and water, it goes in a cyclic form, right? So this is why we are now looking at, the world is now looking at renewable sources of energy because non-renewable sources of energy are going to be extinct in future, right? So that's where alternative sources of energy are being looked. Now if you observe further, there is a distribution map here of mineral resources and several other resources as well we will be looking in this lecture. So first let's go with mineral resources map in the world. What you need to understand is this pattern, the geographical pattern of mineral availability and this is related to the mines, to the rock formations, to the geological structures across the world. So if you know the physical geography of the world, you know the mineral geography of the world as well. So observe here in Western Europe, in the Central Europe, in Asia, some portions in Northern Africa, then in Eastern coast of America, further in African countries distributed and um, South America as well. Then in India, we know Chotanagpur Plateau region and several other areas, also in Australia and Indo-Pacific. So these are the areas where you find that resources are concentrated in terms of valuable minerals. Then what else is here? The other resources like iron, copper, bauxite, these are metallic minerals or metallic resources. So look at the metals distribution across the world if you observe here. So world distribution of these metal resources where you observe in the European segment, here in the Americas, in North and South, both of them, then in Australia, also in India and Indo-Pacific, in China, right, in Russia. So this is where the concentration of these particular metallic mineral resources or you say metals exist, right. Then comes to this world distribution of mineral oil and coal. This is what is running the industry across the world. So where you find the concentration, mostly in the OPEC countries, around the Middle East, European nations, then you have some in America, North and South both, and some in Australia, right, and few in India as well, and Africa as well. So you observe this is the major distribution of resources in terms of mineral oil and coal in the world. Then further, look at this particular flow diagram, or you can observe it as a table, where you will find oil and natural gas, its advantage, disadvantage, right? So what you need to observe here, that what are the advantages and disadvantages? So one key here is to do SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threats to these resources around the world. It means conventional sources of energy as well as non-conventional sources of energy. Both of the energy sources, what we need to do is the strength analysis, weakness analysis, opportunities in the sectors and also the threat, right? So this is where you, need, you can stop the video here and you can note it for yourself. This is taken from NCRT, so you can also look into the NCRT, this is given. But this point is important to understand in terms of its strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threat. Now, one by one, let's deal a little more on these resources. For example, hydel power resources, right? Or hydropower resources that we say, this is what is it looks like. Creation of a dam and then producing hydel power. So this is one of the very common resources across the world which is being developed because it is dependent upon renewable source of energy that is water, right? So this is one part of the energy. Norway was the first country in the world to develop hydroelectricity and now in Indian context that there are numerous hydropower from medium to small to the large scale hydropower projects in India, right? So the leading producers of hydropower in the world are who? Paraguay, Norway, Brazil, China. Right? And in India, remember Bhakra Nangal project, then we have Nagarjun Sagar and Damodar Valley projects, DVC Corporation. So these are several examples across the world in India, which you can quote for Heidel power generation. Then further, let's go to the wind energy. Now advantages and disadvantages, some of them are listed here. Wind energy is non-polluting, low cost production of electricity, safe and clean. But at the same time, disadvantage, noise pollution, windmills costly to set up basically but production cost is less, but setup cost is very high, right? And then harmful to the birds sometimes. Then solar energy, tidal energy, other nuclear energy, biogas energy, geothermal energy, which is basically non-conventional sources of energy. Observe here very carefully that all these non-conventional sources of energy have great advantages, but still disadvantages like the radioactive waste, expensive, it's not cost effective so that it could be used in every household. That is the major challenge in this sector, right? So that's important to understand. Then in non-conventional sources of energy, if you look here, what is important? That the increasing use of fossil fuel across the world is going to create energy crisis. Recently, the coal 
crunch in India was also in news if you remember. So what is here that there is need for using non-conventional sources of energy such as solar energy, wind energy, tidal energy which are renewable in nature. Right. So let's look at solar energy. Remember India also has a solar mission, national solar mission where government provides subsidy on installation of the solar panels at home and offices. So solar energy trapped from the sun can be used in solar cells, recharge the batteries and also use it for different purposes of daily life. Right. So basically coming from a tropical country where sunshine is abundant throughout the year, solar cells have great potential. So it's important to understand. Then comes to the wind energy. Wind is also inexhaustible source of energy, right? And it could be tapped. It has huge potentials. And in the modern time, windmills and high speed wind rotate the wind turbine or windmill, which generates the electricity as we know. And there are many places across the world in Europe, in India, where these windmills could be seen, right? But there is more to add to this potential. We need to increase our productivity here. So many mountain passes across the world have also been used for this strong and steady winds, which blow there to harness, to tap their potential. For example, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, UK, USA, Spain, all these countries have huge areas covering this wind energy production if you look into them. Then look into the nuclear power across the world. So nuclear power is obtained from the energy stored in nuclei of the atoms. So remember the nuclear reactions in a controlled way and then harnessing that power and generating electricity from that. So greatest producer of nuclear power in the world is USA and Europe. And in India, remember Rajasthan and Jharkhand have large deposits of uranium, which could be useful in generating this. Now, Thorium, which is also found in large quantities in monazite sands of Kerala, as we know, the nuclear power stations in India are located in Kalpakkam in Tamil Nadu, then Tarapur in Maharashtra, Rana Pratap Sagar near Kota in Rajasthan, Narora in Uttar Pradesh and Kaiga in Karnataka. These are the famous ones in India, if you remember. And now the geothermal energy. Remember, this energy is one of the areas where it is still untapped in Indian context, especially. So heat energy that is obtained from inside the earth, from the water geysers, right? That is called geothermal energy. Now, sometimes this heat energy may be coming to the surface in the form of hot springs, which could be useful in generating the electricity. So geothermal energy based on these hot springs are very common in many areas in the world and USA has the world's largest geothermal power plants followed by New Zealand, Iceland, Philippines, Central America. This could be practiced on the map of the world, right? Now in India, we have potential areas. If you remember Puga Valley that is in Ladakh, very famous and Manikaran in Himachal Pradesh also has several hot water springs. So this, these areas are untapped still where potential lies in future and many other areas can be done through research and development. Then comes the tidal energy. Now, if you look into the tidal energy across the world, because oceans have this huge potential of tides, right? And we can generate the energy from the tide. So it's a huge potential resource. But remember, until we harness, it's not a resource. So there is a potential there. In context to India, if you observe, we are a peninsular country, huge coastlines. So tidal energy is one area where we could also look and venture into in future. So the first tidal energy station was built in France, openings of the sea, if you remember. Now Russia, France and Gulf of Kutch in India also have huge tidal mill farms as well, right? So that's one area to be worked out for future. So remember, in terms of world energy, resources and their distribution, it's important to not just understand how is the pattern across the world, but also what is the difference between renewable and non-renewable and where is the future going? Where is this energy crisis leading us to and what are the potential areas which could be tapped in order to get into a zone of surplus from the zone of crisis that is important to understand. Then there is one more area in India, especially we see that is biogas especially the organic waste material of plants and animals used in a gas tank and then it is used for also cooking purpose for electricity generation as well. So remember biogas is an excellent fuel for cooking and lighting and producing huge amount of organic manure in the end of the year as well. So organic waste 
is one area because we are generating lots of waste. So this could be one areas and already it's in vogue, it's in use since long time now. So this is another area which is important to understand. So now when we have learned about the details of world resources, their distribution, various concepts, in the sessions to come, we'll be talking more on different other topics of economic geography. So stay tuned, stay safe and keep watching and learning and also don't forget to share the videos with others as well.